Genesis chapter number 9. Noah's already done, got off the ark. He's, you know, no, I, I thought Brother Randy was coughing at me. He was just coughing. Anyway, Noah's already gotten off of the boat. Okay, end of chapter number 8. Verse number 20, Noah built an altar unto the Lord, took every clean beast and every clean fowl, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. Well, you say, if he only had two of each animal, where would he get them from? What do you think animals do on arcs? They have other little animals. Right. Or, also, keep in mind, when Noah went onto the ship, or onto the boat, the ark, he took two by two of every, but he also took many of the clean animals. He's already planning on a sacrifice while he's on there. Amen. Especially when he got off. Okay, but then verse number 20 ends him sacrificing. Verse number 21. The Lord smelled a sweet savor. Because of what Noah did on the altar, it was pleasing unto God. And because it was pleasing unto God, Verse number 21, it says, And the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more everything living as I have done. Okay. Now, in the foreknowledge of God and God's perfect omniscience and omnipresence and omnipotence, God knew that Noah was going to get off the ark and that that sacrifice would smell so sweet that God would purpose in his heart not to destroy the earth again. Amen. But if Noah didn't, we may not get what we have in chapter number 9. Okay, go down to verse number 12. And God said, This is the token of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. So chapter 8, end of the chapter, God said, because of how sweet Noah's sacrifice was, I will make a covenant with them. And then in chapter 9 we get the covenant. What was the token of that covenant? The rainbow. Okay, And I hate that all the queers took that and have bastardized it. But anyway. I, it makes me angry when I see a flag with the colors on it. But if I see one in the sky, it makes me kind of happy. Okay. But this bow as we would call a rainbow God set it in the cloud for what purpose as a perpetual reminder to perpetual generations that God through his mercy will not destroy the earth and all flesh on the earth with water ever again does it say that God quenched his wrath no God's, wicked with, God's angry with the wicked every day it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. But God in His grace and His mercy said, man's going to be evil from his youth regardless of which generation it is. The imaginations of his heart are evil from the time that he starts breathing air until the time that he dies. But God showed grace and mercy and said, but I won't destroy all flesh again. Not because they deserve it. Not because there's anything that they can do to merit but because of Noah's obedience and Noah's appreciation. He didn't go and make a sacrifice for sin. He went to the altar out of praise and worship. He didn't spend just 40 days and 40 nights on the boat. You study it out, the waters assuaged, then the ground was still a whole bunch of soupy mess. And I don't know about you, I don't fancy getting off of an ark where I've been cramped up for 40 days just to step in a whole big you know, pot of quicksand. Right? He had to wait for the ground to settle. Okay, go dump a pile of sand in a hole in your backyard and then try and drive a car over it the next day. What's going to happen? That sand's going to say, you have to let it settle. And then if we do it, most of the time we got to go back and put more on top of it because after it settled, there's more room at the top. Right now, imagine that 
but everywhere on the earth. Except for the very foundations of the earth, which some would argue shifted. Okay, you say, well, how did a whole bunch of... They say you can go to the Grand Canyon and find dirt that matches dirt everywhere else in the world. Okay, how'd that happen? God picked it all up with the water and dumped it down where he wanted it. No, I'm not going to chase that rabbit. But point being, God remade everything. It was not what it was before Noah got onto the ark. It was something different. And Noah stepped off of the ark with the minds. The last thing that he saw was a world so wicked that God purposed in his heart to destroy it. And he got off the ark, and it was the way that God had remade it. And he was just overcome. He said, well, first thing we're going to do is build an altar, boys. Praise and worship God. By the way, what do you think he was doing for 40 days on the ark? Praising and worshiping God. But because of Noah's insignificant, had nothing in and of itself, but it was an act to show God how much Noah appreciated I mean, I'm sure for a hundred years, God, you know, spoke once to Noah, gave him the plans for the ark, and then that's all that we find that he spoke to until he said, hey, go get on the ark. But I'm sure that every day for a hundred years, God's saying, Lord, thank you for giving me the plans of this boat. Amen. Amen. Lord, thank you for showing me mercy. Sure. Lord, thank you for showing me grace. Amen. So why would it be any different than when he got off of the ark? Lord, thank you for bringing me through. Thank you for keeping me in the ark. Amen. Thanks for sorting out all that nonsense with them animals, because I don't find where Noah was a farmer. Well, afterwards he was, because, you know, hey, he owns everything. But before, I don't know what Noah did for a living. I do know that he was well enough off that for a hundred years he could work on an ark and not go hungry. God took care of him. Amen. But when Noah gets off, it's not, well, hey, let's go scout everything out. He's not saying, hey, let's go see if we can find that hill that we used to live on and build a house there again. He knew that hill was gone. First thing he did is he got off of the ark and he worshipped God. And because of that worship, the sincerity of the worship, and how profoundly Noah just wanted to give back to God, God said, I'll never do again what I just did. And as a token, not because God was going to forget, but because man won't forget he said, I'll put my bow in the cloud as a reminder that I did it once and only because of grace and mercy and how much those that put their faith and trust in me appreciate grace and mercy. I won't do it again. Amen. Okay, but I was sitting there one day thinking about rainbows. Okay, rainbow got seven colors. Okay. I didn't do a whole bunch of reading, but I'm sure you could find a whole bunch of people that would give you a whole bunch of different reasons for all the colors in the rainbow. Okay? Uh, this is the Jordan Foster explanation of things in the Bible that have the same colors, and that's what we're going off of. You can say that purple means whatever you want to. I'm just going based off what the Bible says. Okay? But when you look at a rainbow, what color is always on the outside? red because it always bends this way and red's on the outside violet's on the inside and unless you're in Hawaii or someplace where rainbows are just you know pristine conditions to see them you never see the whole rainbow you only get part of it in fact I think it was was it the first second week of revival I had Naj and we was coming up Camp Ernst because 275 is all backed up and we had to get off at Hebron because getting on 70 whole big mess but right as we came around the, the bend in Camp Earth boom rainbow right over the church vibrant bright but I couldn't see all of it in fact when we got off of the interstate and we was driving around I said hey I saw about this much of a rainbow well I found the other half of it when I got to church Right where I was standing in the first place, couldn't see all of it, but I got a piece of it. 
Then even when I could see it better, still couldn't see all of it. Only got a, a portion of it. But no matter what you get, what's always on the outside, red. Right? Red in the Bible. What is it? Sacrifice of Christ, not mine. You don't get any further into the rainbow unless you go through the blood. Okay, well, we're going to skip one. We're going to go to yellow. And you say, why? Give me a second and you'll figure it out. If red is the blood and the sacrifice that Christ made for sin, well, what's yellow? Well, that's Christ's righteousness. God's holiness. Right? What did Job say? Though he try me, I will come forth as gold. Right? What's that mean? The purity. Yellow. Right? Everywhere. The purest gold. It's always yellow gold. You can't have 24 karat white gold because it's a mixture of two different things. You can have 24 karat silver, but they don't do that. They do it on a thousand system. It's like .999 silver. But the purest gold, it's always yellow. Right? God's righteousness, purest righteousness that there is. Right? Well, what do you do when you get yellow and red mixed together? Orange. So now we're going back one. Why? Orange isn't there to remind us about something of God. Orange is to remind us because of the blood and because of God's righteousness, now I can have righteousness. Because my righteousness is his filthy rags. But because of God's sacrifice, because of God's righteousness, I can now be robed in his righteousness through the blood. Well, now let's skip ahead a few. We've already got yellow. Right? God's righteousness. Well, let's go forward two more. Was that blue? Blue was one of the three colors that the priests used to wear on the attire that the high priest had to wear when he took in the blood sacrifice for the year and put it on top of the Ark of the Covenant. The other two were red and violet, or purple, as they would call it. Right? That blue, what did it symbolize? It symbolized God's power. Show me one person in the world that has power over the water except God. Jesus walked on it. How many times did God part the Jordan River for the Israelites? When he took Israel out of captivity, what did he do? Parted the Red Sea. What did he do with the waters here in those days? He broke up the foundations of the deep and water that wasn't there came pouring forth. But there's only so much water on the face. Well, what happened? God made more of it. Broke up the very foundations of earth with the power of the water. You find, go back to Genesis chapter number 1. In the beginning, before the earth was formed in anything, it was without form. It was void. What do you find? The Spirit of God moving upon the face of the waters. But not only that, where's God's throne? In the side of the north. If it's sunny, what color is the sky? Blue. But see, that's just as far as I can see when the sun's up. When the sun's down, I can get a little bit farther. See, some of them things God hung out there. But you get a telescope, one of the big ones, the fancy ones, like the Hubble that's up in space. You find, you start looking out there, there's a whole lot of blue in the galaxy. A lot of nebulas, planets, everything else. What is it? It's all under God's feet. His throne's higher than anything that I can imagine. So he has power over all of it. Right, well, what do you get when you mix yellow and blue together? God's righteousness and God's power. Well, because I'm robed in his righteousness, I have no power. The arm of flesh will fail me. But through his righteousness, he can impute power unto me. Green is a token that when I can't, God can. Amen. Amen. When my righteousness fails, his won't. And if he wasn't righteous, he wouldn't have all power. And if he didn't have all power, he wouldn't be holy. So the two go hand in hand. But because he is both of those things, and great, doesn't matter what comes my way, I'm not relying on, on my power. He gave me his power. I can do all things through Christ, which 
strengtheneth me. Didn't say that he'd use my power and to do something. No, no, no. He gives me his and then allows me to do it. And really, let's be honest. By allowing me to do it, it means he lets me get out of the way and he does it. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Right, so now we've already covered blue. So let's skip one more and get to violet. Well, what was violet? Violet was always the most expensive color. Because in order to get it, you'd have to take some really, really tiny worms smash them up and the color that they produced was that rich royal purple right kind of like the color of the carpet on this stage it was a very labor intensive process to get it and certainly if you very small worms right you could breed them and you could farm it's still going to take a lot to get enough dye to dye a shirt dye a pair of pants dye a robe or a tunic so if you wore purple at any point in the Bible use well off more often than not you were royalty so if blue is the power of God violet is God's royalty it'd be one thing if he said that I have all power which is what Jesus said when he got up out of the grave right but no 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 he doesn't just have all power he rules and he reigns because he's the king of kings and lord of lords one thing to have power it's another thing for nobody else to be able to do anything unless God gives them the power when he said I have all power you don't breathe unless God wants you to right rain doesn't fall if God doesn't want it to the ATM even though you may have money in the account the ATM's not going to work if God doesn't want it to Right, the bank tellers, you, if God doesn't want you to get it out, you go into the bank, hey, sorry, our computers are down right now. Can you come back later? But if God wants you to have it, you can open up a fish and there's going to be your taxes in it. But what's the point? It's not just that God is powerful. Goliath was powerful, but he wasn't even king of the Philistines. Goliath didn't do what he wanted to do. Goliath bowed the knee to somebody else. God doesn't bow the knee to anyone. In fact, show me in the Bible where anybody comes to them and they don't fall on their face. Where they don't humble themselves. Because those that do business with God must understand he's, he's greater than I am. Those that didn't bow, most of the time they left unchanged. Because they didn't accept what God said. They didn't recognize it well one day everybody's going to recognize it when we stand before one of the two thrones that he's going to sit on Amen. judgment seat of Christ or the great white throne of judgment Amen. but because of his royalty and because of his power he's made me a king and a priest indigo Amen. Amen. no 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 I'm not the king but the king's given me a position in his house well, what is it? I don't know. We'll figure that out in the millennial reign. Don't worry about it. Right? Well, when all is said and done, there's seven colors in the rainbow. Four of them are to remind us about who God is. Three of them are to remind us what God did. First one of what he did, orange, because of the blood and because of his righteousness, that's a sign of our spiritual adopt, you know, birth. We were born into the family. Okay, well, what's the next one? Because of his power, because of his righteousness, right? That's a sign of my adoption. He chose to give me his name. To be associated with him. He didn't just birth me, he adopted me. And the third one, why, I still can't figure it out, Brother Rod, but he made me a joint heir to his throne. I don't get that one. Does it mean that I have the same? No, 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 no. He's just saying, because I love you, everything that I have is yours. But in the eyes of God, I'm just as much a king as the Bible says I am. I may not think it, but God sees it. And that's what he does for anybody who puts faith and trust in the Christ. But turn with me, if you will, really quick. Book of Ezekiel. 
Ezekiel chapter number 1. And just in case your Bible might be like mine, it's the very last verse of the chapter that we're going to be reading. So if the last verse of the chapter isn't on that page, turn the page. That's what the rainbow symbolizes. It is a covenant between God and man. But God said, I will put my bow in the cloud. The bow used to be something that only God saw. But he said, as a token, as a sign of how serious I am, I'm going to give mankind for all generations henceforth something that used to be mine so that they can see it and say, God was serious about what he said. Okay, what We can go over to Revelation, but we're not going to because we don't have enough time. But over in Revelation, it's the third time that you'll find, that's the only time you'll find the word rainbow is in the New Testament in Revelation. But it's one of three times that specifically it talks about the bow being the bow of God. Okay, you got a lot of bows that had arrows in them, but not rainbows. But in Revelation, where do you find the rainbow? Over to the throne of God. Right? It is a token to us that said, used to, this only belonged to God, but he shared it with us. Okay, well, Ezekiel, chapter 1, last verse, number 28. As the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain. In other words, he's saying, it looked like a rainbow. Well, what was it? He said, so was the appearance of the brightness round about, the light that shone around him. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell upon my face and heard a voice of one that spake. So what does Ezekiel say? He's saying that because, you know, he got a little glimpse of the glory of God. He's saying, I saw the glory of God and it looked a whole lot like that rainbow God put in the clouds. And what did John say when he got a view of it over in Revelation? Hey, y'all, um, God's got a rainbow up in heaven. Well, what's it a symbol of? The glory of God. Did not Christ endure suffering that he would bring much glory to the Father? What is everything that we just talked about? What Christ did for us and when we put our faith and trust in him like Noah did, it glorifies the Father? Because of Noah's faith, he gave Noah a token of being able to see a likeness of the glory of God. Moses got to see it. Right? He got to see his hind parts and he got to see his glory. Well, what did Noah see? Well, I'm pretty convinced Noah saw the same colors that we see in the rainbow. Why? Because Ezekiel said, the light that shone around me, it wasn't normal light. It looked like a rainbow and it felt a whole lot like the glory of God. Right? Well, where are we going with this, Brother Jordan? Well, See, that's, that's the normal part. Now i got to get into a little bit of science class with y'all. Okay, we're going a little bit deeper. Now, I know no man can see God's face and live. Peter got a little bit more of a glimpse on the Mount of Transfiguration, and he's ready to start building temples, not only to Jesus, but also to the two prophets that were there with him. Right, he said, I got just a taste of what he looked like. And I was ready to, you know, just start grabbing boulders and building. Right, man knows that there's something special about rainbows from the day of the point. Why do you think he used to have a whole bunch of people chasing the end of a rainbow looking for a little short guy with red hair and a green hat on? They said, that's different, there's something special about it, and they created a lore behind it. Right, the very heart of man knows, that's cool. I can't figure that out. You don't see them colors anywhere else in nature all together except in a rainbow. Okay, well, we go a little bit deeper. What is a rainbow? I've been, I've been debating for about three weeks, Brother Bob. They tell me that the lights that we got on in here, they produce a white light. 
right? Because when you look at the light bulb, it looks white. It's what the sun produces. It's a little bit more of a yellow to it, but it's white light. Okay, and really the sun doesn't produce it. It's just reflecting wherever God turned it on at anyway. Because light before the sun. Anyway. So when God made light, when we see it, it's white. But inside of that white light is every color in the rainbow and every color that you can see. In fact, it's only when you get, if this were a triangle, let's pretend that this is equal and this is a prism. Okay? If I shine a light into it and it refracts at the right angle, then I can see all of the colors inside of that white light. In fact, this tie that I'm wearing, it's not really pink. That's the color that's bouncing off back at your eyeballs. It's absorbing every other color except the pink. That's why you see pink. Okay, I know we're going way deep down the rabbit hole real quick. Okay. But what am I saying? Light's a whole lot more complicated. So what I've been debating is, did God change light or did God change people's eyes? Because he said he put his bow in the cloud. And really, no point, maybe this is going to help you, but I've been trying to figure it out. But see, I think that God changed people's eyes. Why? Because God created light, and he saw it, and he said, it is good. Right. Amen. So maybe it was always up there, because rocks will cry out and praise God. Well, maybe the way that clouds cried out and praised God was they just showed God a little bit of the what best they could do to mimic his glory. That was a rainbow. Right? But man never saw it until God hung it in the cloud. So was it like the Wizard of Oz? Was everything before Noah got off of the ark black and white? I don't think so. But at some point, God turned it on and said, there's the rainbow, and Noah said, I've never seen that before. And ever since, people have been saying, man, that's something special. People go to Hawaii, and what do they do? They take pictures of rainbows. It's the same colors, but, oh, it's a much more beautiful place. But it's the same thing. No matter where you... Every rainbow is the same components. God hung it in the cloud. You can't have rainbow without the rain. Amen. Right? Without moisture in the air. Without clouds in the sky. And if there wasn't any rain, and there weren't any clouds, maybe there weren't any things up there. But when God said the rain came, then the clouds came. I don't know. What well, I'm saying, Bob, I, I can't figure it out. Can't, not really important. It's just something I've been thinking about. We'll know it one day, and it won't be important then, because we'll be with him. But the point I'm trying to make is, a lot of people just satisfied with seeing the rainbow. It is not God's glory, because God hung it there as a token. It's just one of them things that God made to be what he wanted it to be which was a representation of his glory because that's what Ezekiel said in verse number 28 that this was the appearance of the likeness of the glory it wasn't the glory of God it looked like the glory of God it's the best that our pea brains can make sense of the glory of God with this curse of sin on it Okay, I mean, John the Revelator, he got a look of what he's going to look like in glory, and he said, I don't have the words to do it. All I've got is what we know. And he had skin. It, was, it kind of looked like brass, but it wasn't brass. It just kind of looked like that. Right, hair white as wool, but that doesn't do it justice. Right, it's whiter than any white you've ever seen. Right, in the voice of many rushing waters, it doesn't really do justice to what he sounds like, but that's the best I've got to compare it. But some people are just so amazed with the rainbow that they just want to stop and take a picture and then go home. So with the Lord's help, we're going to teach on what's inside the rainbow. A little bit more science class for you. What's the first layer of the rainbow? Red. So what's on the outside of the blood of Christ? Well, that's the infrared. You can't see that part. In fact, they've got infrared radar guns and infrared. I've got an infrared thermometer at work that I have to use to take people's forehead temperature. I don't see the laser beam that comes out, but I know that it comes out because it bounces back and then the thermometer says, well, hey, this is how warm they are. They do or they do not have a fever. But what's the infrared? That's anything that's lower than red. 
What's that a type of? Well, if you get into the blood, you need to forget and stop seeing all the stuff that's out in the world. Amen. You shouldn't be able to look back and say, well, oh yeah, I know that, I know that, I know that. Granted, we're not perfect. But there's things that used to bother me don't bother me no more. There's things that used to were a stumbling block to me that God's removed them. I don't see them no more. Anything that I've done, no. I've just tried my best to get a little bit further into the rainbow. Now, some people want to take a picture of the rainbow and turn around and go back to what they knew. I'm glad you saw the rainbow. But see, the rainbow's just... It's just the smallest tasty. It's the smallest drop of ice cream you can put in a spoon and then taste. It should want you to get further instead of going back to what you knew. Right? It's just a sign of, hey, this is what God wants to do in your life. He wants you to bring glory unto Him. Not because of what you can do, but because of what Christ did for you. But see, then on the other end, over here on purple, on violet, there's a thing called ultraviolet. That's what gives you a suntan. Didn't Noah's face shine, or not Noah, didn't Moses' face shine when he came down off the mountain from talking with the burning bush? What happened? He got into the ultraviolet. He got so close to God that it changed the way that he looked. In fact, he was shining so bright, you know, he probably looked like me on the last cruise that we took when I thought we was only going to be canoeing for about 30 minutes, and then three hours later, we was still canoeing, and I only put on one layer of sunscreen and didn't bring none else, and then Christian took a picture, and in the scrapbook, put a picture of me and a whole bunch of lobsters. <laughs> Why? Because I was that red. But see, just because I was that red, they could still look at me, Brother Donald. I wasn't blinding to them. Right? I just spent a little bit of time out in the sun, and I got red. Well, in order for you to get a little bit closer to the S-O-N, right, there are some things that are going to get burnt. Our God is a consuming fire. And if you want to get into the ultraviolet, God told Noah to put off his shoes. Not Noah, Moses. I'm going to start calling it the book of Noah here in a second. Anyway. Moses told him to put off his shoes. Right? What did Christ tell, you know, sons of Zebedee and Peter and Andrew? He said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. He's saying, leave your fishing poles. We got a different business. In fact, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with him, they left Zebedee on the boat. They said, Dad, you take care of the business. We're following Jesus. Right? Anybody that came to Jesus and did business, they left something with them. They changed. They looked different. They sounded different. Maybe they saw different, like blind Bartimaeus. Right? He started singing. We knew he was loud before, but can you imagine how loud he got after he knew what he was shouting about? Can you imagine how fast that lame man, when Peter and John said, you know, hey, in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. You imagine how fast he's running and how high he's jumping around the temple that day? Sure. He'd put Usain Bolt to shame. Sure. Right, what's my point? People that get to the ultraviolet, they can't see it. Right? I can't see ultraviolet. But if I do go out and look at the sun, you know what burns out your corneas in your eye? It's the ultraviolet. It's not the light. The light's right there. In fact, those light bulbs put out a little bit of UV. Tanning beds, that's all they are, is UV light bulbs. Right, you don't see it, but they have to put a little bit of purple tint into those tanning bed light bulbs or else you wouldn't know that they were on. Because you can't see it. The strongest lasers are purple lasers. And they're the hardest to make. But if you get your hands on one, they say you can pop balloons from like five miles away with it. Right? You, can light, you can light matches on fire just by shining the thing at the end of the match. In fact, I saw a guy on YouTube who did one. It was so powerful, it just melted the match. Didn't even light it on fire. What's the point you're making? The further you get in, and eventually inside the rainbow, you're going to see some things that just don't make sense to you you can't figure out why they happen 
But just on faith, well, he's God. I don't need to figure it out. I can't see it. Can't figure out what's going on. But it doesn't matter. And the more you hang around it, the more you're going to start looking a little bit different. Some of y'all may get freckles like me. Right? Everywhere that, in fact, be, still to this day, there's a line right here. I got freckles below it because I had to churn on when I got really burned out there in the middle of the stupid kayak that was supposed to take 30 minutes. Right? And they kept me out there for four hours or however long it was. But to this day, haven't been sunburnt since. There's still a perfect line. No freckles, freckles. That doesn't matter how long it's been. If you get really close to Jesus, there's going to be signs. Well, you say, well, I don't know what he did. Me either. That's why he had to do it. If we could figure it out, we'd be able to do it. But what's inside the rainbow is living in revival. We see the rainbow. Oh, man, Lord. We saw a little bit of your glory. And that's fantastic. Hallelujah. But that should have to propel me to get inside the rainbow. You say, well, how do you get there? Hey, he's got to take you. I can't tell you. I can't tell you where a rainbow starts or where it ends. I got a pretty good idea. Probably starts in heaven and ends in heaven because there's one over God's throne. Amen. Right, well, if you can't figure out how to get there, well, you, you just got to let him lead you. And I got to tell you, even though you might be saved, you're going to have to go through the blood a few times. Because daily, I got to crucify the old man. I've got to repent of what I did. Daily, I've got to be reminded that, hey, because of his righteousness is the only reason God doesn't just wipe me off the face of the earth. Because of my adoption. Because of his power, it doesn't matter what happens on, in my life. He's in control of it. Right? And because of his royalty, nothing can happen to me unless he ordains it. But if you get inside, you know them colors by heart. You don't have to keep turning around and looking at the rainbow. Why? Because you'll be looking at the sun. S-O-N. If you get a good look at him, I mean, everybody ever came to, you find that they spend either a good portion of their life or the rest of their life telling everybody that they could what Jesus did for them. Until they ran out of people to tell. Why? Because they got a look at him and it was burned into their eyeballs. They got such a good look that when they closed their eyes at night, they saw the face that took all their problems and all their sin away. They got such a good look that every time they saw somebody else, they didn't see, oh, well, that's an inconvenience to me. That's something that's, you know, going to take time out of it. No, no, no. They saw themselves because they were looking through the eyes of Christ. Through hindsight, they could say, well, that's what I used to be. And if he could do it for me, he can do it for them. I already told you, you stare at that light bulb long enough, you're going to blink and you're going to see a little black spot there. Right? There's a lot of people that are out in the world looking at bright lights and it blinds them to what God wants to do. But if you get a good look at Jesus, it won't blind you, it'll illuminate your eyes. It'll help you see things as God sees them. Where do you get that perspective? From here. But I read that every day. You get further into the rainbow, you're going to start reading things you never read before. You get further into the rainbow, you're going to finally, you know, just like that song said, I just started living. The closer you get to God, you just started reading. There's more in there than you thought. Not just for today, but silly thoughts like, hey, did he change light or did he change people's eyeballs? I still don't know. Doesn't matter. But I want to know the answer to it because that's the way that God built me. I don't like unanswered things. I'm willing to take it on faith. I know he did it because I see him. I just can't figure out how he did it. But I know why he did it. To remind, you know what revival meetings are? The rainbows in the sky to say, hey, you remember how good God was? Some of us are going up to a waterfall with a cup and trying to catch as much water as we can and saying, all right, it's enough revival for me. No, you've got to get under the waterfall. You've got to get past the waterfall because what's on the other side? what God wants you to do. God doesn't dump out revival. God doesn't invite people to the inside of the rainbow just to say, well, okay, you got to the inside of the rainbow. Pat you on the head and say, go on. 
The reason he sends the waterfall is so that we go take the water to the world. The reason he sends the rainbow is so that we can say, hey, you ain't going to believe what I saw. And we've got the proof in our life to back it up. You could say, well, you're not going to believe what Jesus did for me. Well, unless you get the freckles, unless your skin gets a little bit tanner, unless you got so close that maybe some of the things in your life burned away that used to be there, may not be instant, but you get close to them, you're going to get back and you're going to find, oh, hey, I got a whole lot of skin peeling off. What happened? God killed it off in your life. And what do you do? You get rid of it because you realize, I didn't need that. Is it going to be painful? Sometimes. You're going to get a boil every now and then? Probably. But if you just surrender it, it probably wouldn't hurt so much. But the further you get inside, the closer you get to God. Because like I said, the rainbow is around the throne. What's on the inside of it? Him. Just like the psalmist, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me. Why? Because goodness and mercy are just around God and I'm going to be so close to them that they have to be behind me. Amen. They ain't saying, I got no doubt about that. If I get close to him, everything's going to be good. There's going to be tons of mercy because it just drips off of them. But I want to get so close that the things that drip off of them are going to fall behind me. That's how close I am to them. Some people say, well, hey, that rainbow looks nice. I want to see what's inside the rainbow. I want to get to what's you know the rainbow is shouting and saying hey you got to get a look at this you can't really see all of it because right now with these sin cursed eyes we can't really comprehend all of his glory but every now and then he'll let us feel how much glory he has just dump it out on us in the service Amen. and then even then that's one drop in Niagara Falls compared to the glory that God has right. right if he gave us any more than that our heads just explode like an Indiana Jones because our brains cannot handle these sin-cursed bodies cannot handle the manifest presence of God. But every now and then he just sends a rainbow and says hey, come on into the inside. It's not going to be every day because you couldn't handle it every day. But if you get in it one day, next time you see a rainbow you're going to be headed inside the rainbow. Right, next time that you've got a storm you're praying, man I hope at the end of the storm there's going to be a rainbow. Or when there's clouds in the sky and there's a rainbow, you're going to say, hey, I need to get inside that rainbow because the storm might be coming. And every now and then you'll see one when there aren't any clouds in the sky. What's that? It's a picture of you just what? I can see clouds on the horizon and say, well, it's either going to be really humid today or it's going to rain. I don't have to be a meteorologist to tell you clouds mean rain. Especially the dark ones and the really tall ones that get flat on top. That's when the thunder and the lightning hits. You can see that coming from a while, you know, miles and miles away. But every now and then God will say, hey, there aren't any clouds in the sky, but here's a rainbow today. Because there's something coming that you can't see that unless you get in the rainbow, you aren't going to be prepared for. And he's saying, all I want to do is just show you a little bit more of me. Give you a little bit more glory give you a taste of something say, you can go back out and say hey I don't know what y'all are putting your faith in but what I've got changes me you can see it in fact that's what that Shunammite maid said to Solomon she said I can't believe that you're in love with me for I am black what does that mean she worked out in the sun and she was tanned but very tanned because every day she labored out under the sun if every day you're laboring for the S-O-N you're going to look different than everybody else. And the rest of the world may say, nah, I don't want them. They're ugly. Jesus says, they're the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. The king says, no, no, no. Not just working in the king's house. No, no, no. She became a bride to the king. One day we're going to be married to him and be with him forevermore. Be joined and never separated. He's saying, right now, you don't understand it, but the king's saying, I can see what she looks like in all them jewels and all that finery, sitting at the other end of the you know, king's table with politicians, dignitaries, and everything else sitting there, and he's saying, yeah, that's a jewel. The rest of the world may not like it, but I do. What's the point? You get to the inside of the rainbow, you don't tell them what God's going to do. 
Why? Because God's ways are above. Let's be honest. You may have an idea what God wants you to do, but you really don't have a clue about what God wants you to do. Because God may tell you to go, but you don't know anything that's going to happen after you go. I outline them. Most of the time they don't come out the way that they're outlined. Why? Because I had an idea and God said, nope. But a lot of times you wake up and you say, okay, well, I'm going to start my day this way, this way. And before you know it, everything's off track. But if you get to the rainbow, I'm not saying every morning is going to be a morning where you don't have a bad day or day or where the kids aren't driving you nuts or where the car is hitting out of gas because yesterday it had half a tank, you could have swore, but today it's almost empty. All right, well, how would that happen? I lost a few days in between there. I just didn't look at the gas gauge. So now i got to stop and get gas. But when you get a good look at him, okay, Lord, what are you trying to do? Why is this going wrong? Well, in my head, it's going wrong. Maybe God just wants you to hand a track to somebody on the other side of the pump. Yeah. Right? Maybe you ran out of hair product because the lady at whatever store you buy it from needed to hear about Jesus. Yeah. Right? Maybe you got that piece of bad news because God knew, one, he had prepared you for it, but two, if you get close to him, you're going to start shining like Moses. You're bright enough to shine into that dark situation. The darker it gets, the more, the foggier it gets, the more that the devil blinds people's eyes, the more light it takes to get through it. But you know when fog disappears? When the sun comes out. You know when clouds disappear? When the sun evaporates all the moisture in them. You just be a good mirror and reflect everything that God points at you to have people in the world. He'll do all the work, I promise you that. We just got to be willing to say, all right, Lord, point me in the right direction. And instead of saying, well, I've got to go do something that I didn't expect today, so I'll leave my mirror here and come back and get it later. It doesn't work that way. But what's inside the rainbow? Seeing a rainbow may make an impact on you. Certainly getting saved is going to have an impact on you. But you get to the inside of the rainbow, people aren't going to be able to recognize you because what you used to be and what you look like now are so completely different. Revival is God doing a work in your life so bad or so big that people out there can't wait to get what you've got because they look and they say, I need that so bad. We're written epistles. But when we get to heaven, how many books is God going to open up and say, you never got inside the rainbow? If you enjoyed today's message, head on over to ibcforums.com and click on sermons. And don't forget to check out our other links in the notes section of today's broadcast. As always, thanks for listening.